As the financial and death toll weighs on the nation, states around the country are finding ways to reopen. Our David Begno has the story. As the nation grieves the loss of nearly 100,000 Americans to COVID-19, California hit a milestone Wednesday, 100,000 coronavirus cases. That happened on the same day retailers in Los Angeles reopened their doors for the first time in two months. It's scary to open your doors, but we're gonna, we're gonna be, use every precaution. To Nevada now, at least 10 Las Vegas casinos announced that guests can return on June the 4th. Among the new restrictions, limiting players at the game tables and spacing out slot machines. It's gonna be a whole new Vegas. Now to Florida. Walt Disney World in Orlando says it will reopen two of its parks on July 11th with limited capacity and without those character meet and greets, fireworks shows, and parades. All of these announcements come as hundreds of thousands of Americans are in mourning. It's penetrating all aspects of society. Maureen O'Donnell writes obituaries for the Chicago Sun-Times. To this veteran reporter, it is the cruelty of the goodbyes, the forced distance between the deceased and their loved ones that she can't forget. One person I wrote about, Alvin Elton, was a terrific darts player in Chicago and very well known, very well liked. And at the end of his life, his wife couldn't touch him. She was lucky enough to be able to touch his face, but through two layers of gloves. Among the 100,000 people who died around this country, she wrote about Emilia Pontarelli, an immigrant from Italy, the matriarch of Tony's Italian Deli in Edison Park, Illinois. She survived the Nazis taking over her town in Italy. And at the end of her life, her family couldn't be with her. They sent a priest to the hospital, and that priest gave holy water to a nurse and blessed her. And then that nurse did a blessing by transference, and that gave great comfort to the family. But the separation is very cruel. Dr. Tom Frieden served as director of the CDC under President Barack Obama. He's currently the president and CEO of Resolve to Save Lives, an organization working to prevent epidemics. Welcome, Dr. Frieden. We really appreciate you being with us. Earlier this month, you correctly predicted that we would be at over 100,000 deaths by the end of the month. And yet we see states taking steps to reopen. Do you believe the country is in a place where we can start relaxing guidelines? I think we have to get past two false dichotomies, Tanya. One is between open and closed, and the other is between health and economy. We were never fully closed, and we won't be fully open unless we have a very effective vaccine that everyone can get. It's more like a dimmer dial. We need to gradually come out, but certain things we just can't do. They're just too risky. Large numbers of people without face masks in small indoor areas is a recipe for disaster. But there are lots of things that we can do that can get our economy restarted without rekindling, because it isn't about health versus economics. We've got to get our economy back, but we're going to do that by controlling the virus, including a strategy that we call box it in. Can you explain that a little bit? Because it sounds like we've been framing the problem incorrectly. Like you said, even if we're fully open and people don't feel confident that they're safe, they're not going to go to restaurants and stores anyway. So open, closed is sort of a meaningless, uh, open or closed is, is, is a meaning, meaningless description. What can, we, what can we do to make people feel safe, be safe, and also get the economy up and going again? Well, there are a few things. First, the box it in strategy is about testing, isolation, contact tracing, and quarantine. These four parts of the box it in strategy keep the virus at bay so that cases don't become outbreaks, outbreaks don't become epidemics. That's really important. Uh, I feel like we have attention deficit disorder, whether it's a travel ban or staying at home or testing, there seems to be a concept that we need to do one thing. There isn't one thing that we need to do. We need to have a comprehensive, meticulous battle plan and then implement it. That means testing strategically and widely, isolating really carefully in hospitals, nursing homes, correctional facilities, homeless shelters, 
uh, contact tracing with really good human to human contact, supporting people so we warn contacts about their exposure, supporting people with the illness so that if they can't be safely isolated at home, they can be provided with an alternative accommodation for 10 days until they're healthier so they don't make their grandmother sick, and quarantining contacts also in a safer place and potentially replacing their income so they don't go to work and infect other people. These are the kind of targeted interventions that can help us get our economy back because exactly as you say, if people don't feel safe, they won't go out even if there's an opening. Yogi Berra used to say, if people don't want to come to the ballpark, how are you going to stop them? And if people don't feel <laughs> comfortable going out, you're not going to be able to restart the economy. Such good points, doctor. I want to ask you about current recommendations by some health experts that are now saying six-foot social distancing guidelines that were recommended by the World Health Organization aren't far enough to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Is there a safe distance people should be apart while still being able to go about their business? There are lots of things we can do to re-engineer, redesign our environment to be safer. And that means, for example, that if you're indoors within six feet of someone, you should all be wearing a mask. If everyone wears a mask, everyone is safer. Also, washing hands regularly, hand sanitizer at the entrance of all buildings, staying home if you're sick, staggering work shifts, avoiding crowded indoor spaces. Outdoors is fine. Outdoors is going to be healthy. But there are things that we just have to be more careful with. When we look around the country and around the world, we see big outbreaks associated with uh, indoor ceremonies, whether that's a, a church ceremony or a dance club. Uh, that kind of enclosed indoor space with lots of people there is a recipe for rapid spread of the virus. And that will not only have a health toll, but an economic toll as well. You know, we've passed a really gruesome milestone, uh, 100,000 estimated deaths from COVID-19 in the U.S. With less than 5% of the world's population, we have nearly 30% of the world's cases. And this really emphasizes the need to take this virus seriously. Every community needs to make sure that they have the services available to redesign their lives to reduce the risk and to box the virus in with testing, isolation, contact tracing, and quarantine to keep it at bay. That way we can resume our economic activity as rapidly as possible. And we're seeing some really good practices all around the country and all around the world of ways to balance that so that we have a synergistic, safer, and more productive uh, society. Uh, doctor, I want to ask you about that terrible number, 100,000 deaths. That is, it's my understanding, confirmed cases. So the actual number could be much higher. I'm wondering what you estimate the actual number of deaths might be, and also whether that, the fact that we don't have more concrete information about the true effect of this disease, uh, of this virus, is that a result of the fact that testing has been so slow and difficult to get? And the second part of my question is, now that it is apparently easier to get in some places, I mean, Governor Cuomo is saying they now the state has more testing capability than, than people who want to be tested, uh, you know, should we all be tested? So a few things there. Um, every death is a death too many. And what we have to do right now is urgently work so that we can prevent as many future deaths as possible. The exact number is quite difficult to pin down. But certainly 100,000 is not a significant overestimate, and it may be somewhat of an underestimate because many people died without being tested or diagnosed as having COVID. Here in New York City, where I work and live, uh, there were many people who died at home with no medical evaluation, and those, uh, those deaths are still being assessed. So there are too many deaths here, but one of the things that we can do is to recognize the different levels of risk. And where there's a lot of risk in society, where the virus is spreading widely, we have to be particularly careful. When it spreads less, we can do more things, but also do that in safer ways. In terms of testing, this also hasn't been well understood. Every person who's hospitalized should get a test. Everyone with symptoms of COVID should get a test. If you're in a what we call a congregate facility, that can be a nursing home, a jail, a prison, a homeless shelter, and anyone tests positive, everyone must be tested so you can get those infected people apart and not have an explosive outbreak. Uh, contacts of patients with COVID should be tested. This is the kind of focused approach we need. All over the world and in the U.S., communities that have 
been guided by public health and have supported public health have done better. They've had less disease, less death, and less economic disruption. Dr. Tom Frieden, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you.